Does everyone still have their handout sheet for StatMec? We're going to do parts D and E now. So the system that we established was a collection of particles with energy levels of 0, epsilon, 2 epsilon, and that's what we focused on for parts A, B, and C for these example questions, uh, uh, practice questions. Now for parts D and E, the last two, the energy levels are unbound, right, which is exactly like what we're dealing with in the case of an ideal monatomic gas for the translational energy. Right? The, in, the energy that a particle can have is effectively infinite as it goes faster and faster and faster and faster. Same idea here. We're looking at different energy levels. So the question is, uh, <clears throat> if we assume that the distance between these energy levels is small, I want you to write out what the partition function is and actually evaluate any summations or integrals that are involved. And I, and I kind of made it easier because I gave you the partition function result. Right, so what you're trying to show is walk us through the steps to demonstrate that the partition function for this system is given by that expression. So that is our starting point. So essentially all I'm asking for is a generalized version of part A, and then you actually have to evaluate the summation. kick things off. Can someone describe to me what is the partition function? Both, I guess, conceptually and then mathematically. So conceptually, any volunteers? Who wants to describe what the partition function is to get us started? No volunteers. Logan, what is the partition function conceptually? It's just the number of ways that the energy states can arrange, or just the number of possibilities. Yeah, it's the collection of all of the possible states of the system. That is the partition function. Now, math, it's a little bit different because it's scaled by the energy for the canonical partition function. Mathematically, how would I, how would I write it out? <coughs> So the partition function is going to be equal to, so we're talking about it's a summation of all the states. So let's start off with that. Okay, so we're going to sum up all of the states. And then what do I write next? Uh, so E raised to the power of negative what? Beta. Negative, negative beta. beta. Energy. I'll call it E of I, let's say. So this is basically the starting point for any system that we're working with with a canonical partition function. Now what makes different models distinct is how we write this capital EI, the energy of state I. So for this particular system here, how would we write the energy of state I from a generalized standpoint? So energy of state I is equal to what? As a function of whatever the properties that we have here are. I'm going to generalize it. Uh, yeah. 
high times epsilon, maybe? Bingo. Or J or X or any parameter we want. So let's call it I epsilon. So that means the partition function is the summation over all the states E to the negative I beta epsilon. Now, what's the second clue that we were given in this problem statement, if you read through it? Well, that's jumping to the catch, but yes, it says assume that the, the energy level spacings are very, very small, which means that we can approximate this summation as an integral going from 0 to infinity, e to the negative i. In my solution, I changed it to x as a, just to make it distinct. And then hopefully from here, it should be a uh, straightforward endeavor to integrate that. So I'll give it a, another second. So typically when it comes to exams, I always, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm a softie with this because I don't remember this stuff ever, so I don't expect anyone else to. I always provide integral to differential tables. Unless it's some, if it's a polynomial, then I don't bother. But if it's anything more involved than that, then I almost always provide the table uh, or the integral result. But in this case here, uh, the integration is just equal to function. Uh, so if we evaluate this, <clears throat> it's equal to e to the negative infinity minus e to the 0, which this goes to 0, this goes to 1, which gives us as our partition function. And I always found this very odd as well that we start off on the partition function as a summation, an infinite summation of all the possible states in the system, and it always ends up spitting out just some number. Right, so based on the distance between the energy levels and the beta of the system, the partition function is just a number. But what's important about it is, is rather the functional form. The number itself I don't think necessarily has any uh, real meaning tag to it. But really how the partition function changes with respect to other variables, that's where the real information is contained uh, within it for actually solving useful problems. But to me it's always a little bit baffling that we start off with this infinite summation and just spits out some number. Questions? How does everyone feel about this? So next step is I want to know what is the internal energy for this system. All right, that's the next part of the question. It says, <clears throat> using the single particle partition function established in part D, which we have right here, what is the internal energy for a collection of indistinguishable particles as a function of the number of particles and beta? All right, so what I'm asking for is if this is a real system with a real finite number of particles, what would be the internal energy of this system as a function of the temperature and number of particles in the system. So this is now where we get to tap in on the equation sheet. Uh, we get to look at that last row that we never have looked at, which is the stat function functions. 
So in this case, the internal energy, because you don't have the necessarily have it in front of you. The internal energy is the natural log of the partition function, the derivative with respect to changes in temperature or beta, reciprocal temperature or beta. This is the expression, and just as a reminder, for a collection of indistinguishable particles, and assuming that there are enough energy states, more energy states than the number of particles, so that two particles will never include, it will never have the same energy state, we can write the partition function for a collection of particles in the canonical ensemble as the partition function for a single particle basically multiplied by itself for all the different types of particles and then normalized by an indistinguishability factor because we can't tell the different types apart. So take a moment and work through the mathematics there. Okay, a few folks are finishing up. Let's start going through it. So first step, let's evaluate the natural log of the partition function. Just expanding with log properties. <clears throat> so let's rewrite this as minus natural log of n factorial. Uh, let's see. So of all of these terms, there's only one of them that is actually a function of beta or the temperature. So this will go away, and this will go away. That means our internal energy, in this case here, um, oh, that's the minus, that's where it is. Minus, in this case, this is going to be n over beta. particular system. 
So it's close to what we got for a particle in a box, but for a particle in a box, it wasn't necessarily a linear relationship between the different energy states and the energy level, right? It was, it was a squared factor. <clears throat> so close, very, very similar, but because the model that we chose for the energy was a little bit different, we're going to get a slightly different result for the internal energy of the system itself. How does everyone feel? The main thing that I want everyone to be comfortable on is the procedure used. Unfortunately, we don't have a tremendous amount of time to talk about the details of the different energy models. And so for the most part, when we're talking about STAT-MEC, we're going to be using uh, off-the-shelf models and just applying them to see how we can understand what's going on about the system. But this is where the real, I guess, the, the main challenge is, is coming up with the different models. But for the most part, it's already been done for us because this is a fairly mature field. Questions? So this transitions us very nicely into an ideal diatomic gas. <clears throat> so the ideal part here Ideal meaning we're not going to consider any energy that's associated with the interaction or the positions of the different molecules. So in the case of a real fluid, something that deviates from ideal gas behavior, the non-ideality is going to be coming from the attraction or repulsion of the individual molecules. When it comes to a liquid, then this is obviously going to be a catastrophically bad approximation because all liquid properties are dependent on these attraction or repulsive interactions. If everything behaved as an ideal fluid, everything would dissolve into everything else. This table would dissolve into the air, and we wouldn't be able to have anything or build anything or do anything. So in the real world, right, this is bad. So all we're doing right now is we're increasing the complexity of the energy of an individual particle. So <clears throat> if we have a diatomic gas, What are the different energy, different ways we can store energy in this particle? What's the first one that we've already talked about? Translational. Translational. Okay, so we can move around in 3D space. What else do we have? Rotational. We have rotation. What else? Vibration. And there's two more that we can talk about but we're going to ignore them. What are some different ways that a real particle can uh, store energy? Electronic. There can be electronic energy states. And the last one is nuclear. Right, it just has a, have, have, just how electrons can be in different energy levels. The, the protons and neutrons in the nucleus can be in different energy levels as well. So that means that our partition function, if we assume that these are all 100% independent modes, meaning that the velocity that the particle is translating in in XYZ space is completely independent from how fast it rotates, which is completely independent from how fast it vibrates, we can write these as individual contributions to the partition function. So the partition function of a single diatomic gas molecule is going to be the partition function of the translation times by the partition function of the rotation, times by the partition function of the vibration, times by the partition function of the electronic state, times by the partition function of the nuclear energy levels. So now, all we need is a model for how it translates, rotates, vibrates, undergoes electronic transitions, and undergoes nuclear transitions. Then we already have the tools established, so once we know how to model the different energy levels, we literally just sum them all up. In some cases we have to sum them, in some cases we can multiply or, or integrate them, but then go through exactly the same relationships that we've already established. So the only difference now between a monatomic and a diatomic gas is the different models that we have to now include for the vibration and the rotation. 
So to kick things off, the translational, <clears throat> we're going to write this in a little bit different form than what we had done before. We're just going to write it as the volume divided by the de Broglie wavelength to the power 3, in which case the de Broglie wavelength is 2 pi m. So this is exactly what we had done before. The only difference here is that instead of the mass of one particle, we're adding together the masses of particle one and particle two within the diatomic gas. But this is exactly the same as the particle in a box that we talked about before, just with the mass different and just with a slightly different, more compact way to write all the coefficients and whatnots. Okay, so translation, done. We already talked about that for the monatomic gas. Now rotation, We are going to use the quantum mechanical rigid rotor. In this model, the energy for rotations for the J energy state So it's going to be a function of some quantum numbers here, Planck's constant and the moment of inertia, which is going to be a function of how far the different particles are from the center of mass, because in a rotation it's going to rotate them around the center of mass. So this model is going to have a degeneracy as well for different energy levels. And this is the expression for the degeneracy if atoms 1 and 2 are different. But we'll cycle back on that momentarily. And we'll, we'll add in some factors to talk about it. <clears throat> So in the case of rotation, just like in the case of translation, the different energy levels for most purposes that we're dealing with, the energy levels are going to be close enough together that we can approximate it as a continuum. For the most case, unless we get to low temperatures, then it's not going to be the scenario. But for everything that we're more or less going to be dealing with, we can approximate this as a small different energy levels together. So in that case, the the rotational partition function <clears throat> is going to be equal to an integral here If we go through the mathematics, this ends up simplifying down quite nicely to an expression that looks like this.
again, it simplifies down to a nice convenient expression. Now, we define something here as a algebraic uh, simplification, basically. But it happens to work out that this has units of temperature. So we call this the rotational temperature. So as a couple of examples, so this, this approach right here is valid if the temperature is much, much greater than the rotational temperature. Otherwise, we can't approximate that infinite summation as an integral. But as an example of some rotational temperatures, so for oxygen, uh, the rotational temperature is 2.8 Kelvin, which I think we're safe and sound on. Uh, for hydrogen, it is 87.5 Kelvin. Again, unless we're doing cryogenic experiments, this is an A-OK -okay approximation. Uh, one note, I'm kind of cramming a lot more here. Uh, uh, let's see, I'll sweep it right here. So the rotational partition function can be more generally written like so, where this sigma parameter is 1 if 1 and 2 are different. <coughs> So in this case here, this would be, for example, like CO, and this would be for like O2. Due to the symmetry, there's fewer configurations of the system that are distinct and unique. Sorry, this is getting a little bit crowded. Next is vibrations. The model selected is the harmonic oscillator model. This is a model that most everyone should have seen in like an ODE's type class or a PDE's type class. If you have two, two particles oscillating and you don't have any damping of the system, this would be the solution to those equations. One thing to note, that if J in this case is equal to zero, we still have some ground state energy from oscillations. So if we apply <clears throat> this energy model, and we calculate the partition function for vibrations for a single particle, doing here is we're just applying the same procedure that we've done in the past. We're just normalizing the energy based on the Boltzmann distribution. So the higher the energy of the system is, the lower the probability it's going to be in that conditions. Or as you increase the temperature, the less that the energy levels matter. Now in the case of the harmonic oscillator, these energy levels are not close together. 
So we cannot approximate this summation as an integral. But the reason why the harmonic oscillator model was selected to model the vibrations of a diatomic gas is because it has a defined infinite summation. So we don't have to worry about replacing the summation with an integral because it has a definite value. And again, for easier or condensed writing, we simplify or substitute algebraically in for what we call the vibrational temperature, which is just a simplification from that formula. So let's see, I have some examples here. Where are they? Ah. <clears throat> So the vibrational temperature is much, much greater than the rotational temperature. So that means that the it is much, much harder to vibrate a molecule than it is to rotate it. And we talked about this a little bit. So how these values are actually obtained, uh, for example, here, 2.8 Kelvin and the 87 Kelvin, these are done by microwave spectroscopy. Now, microwave is a relatively low energy form of radiation. Meaning that if we want to rotate really, really cold cryogenic gases, it only takes a small amount of energy to do so. Now, <clears throat> uh, vibration, on the other hand, is activated by which form of radiation, typically? Infrared. Infrared. So if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, and you look at the energy levels of the electromagnetic spectrum, microwaves are way, 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 way down over there and infrared is at a much higher level. So as a further example of sort of how radiation interacts with materials, um, NMR. Does anybody know what energy level NMR is? What kind of, what kind of radio waves do they use in NMR? Actually, I just love the giant's radio waves. It's, it's a AM, FM radio waves. The energy levels, now this is distinct from the nuclear, right? This is, this is like, ex, so this is like excited electrons, right? Going from the ground state to a high state. This, well, you want to guess what kind of energy levels this is associated with? What kind of radiation? Electronic transitions. UV is good for valence, but if you want to do core electron energy levels, X-rays. So oftentimes you have to go to, a lot of times you have to go to a synchrotron to get enough high energy x-rays uh, to do good quantitative analysis here. Uh, the nuclear levels, we're not talking about that for NMR. NMR nuclear states, we're talking about spin states, spin up versus spin down. The energy level associated with that exchange is on the order of, of AM, FM radio waves. So NMR instruments are extremely sensitive, basically, radios is all that they are. The other thing that's mind-boggling with NMR is that the transition between a nucleus spinning up versus spinning down is a very, very, very low energy transition, meaning that it takes on the order of sometimes seconds or minutes for that space state to relax back down, which to me is a little bit mind-boggling because when we think of how quickly particles and molecules move around, the fact that it might take on the order of seconds or minutes to model that transition going back down to the ground state it is really crazy. 
means it's an extremely low energy transition that NMR is activating. So if there's any other thing that I want everyone to walk away from the class with, is if we have a conceptual understanding of how to model these processes, and that gives us a conceptual understanding of how to measure these processes. So when I go to a conference, or I sit in a qualifying exam, or I go to a proposal defense or a thesis defense, and a student is trying to measure something, based on knowing how to model the different processes, you already have an intuitive understanding of how to probe those interactions in those processes. It gives you a toolbox that it almost makes it seem like you're cheating because all you do is say, oh, okay, they're modeling this transition. You can probe it with radiation of this energy level or you can probe it with te techniques that probe this time scale. And so when you reduce down experimental techniques to the energy level of interaction or the time scale of interaction, then it's really straightforward for you to have a library in your head of all the different techniques knowing which time scales or which length scales or the investigate or energy level scales that they investigate. And when you simplify down all these advanced techniques to those three parameters, then you don't have to know how to do the experiments, but you know that those experiments can give you that right information, if that makes sense. But that's, that is how I can cheat and uh, not have to remember too many details. Okay, oh, so <clears throat> I lost my train of thought. Uh, when we're talking about uh, vibrational temperatures, uh, let's look at the vibrational temperatures. Now, these are the temperatures that we can roughly expect to be activating vibrational modes. Okay, hydrogen, anyone want to venture a guess? At what temperature do we expect that these vibrational modes should be activated? Ballparks. Right, so for, for rotations, we're talking about sub 100 Kelvin. What do, we, what do we estimate here? I'll have a couple of ones that I have hydrogen, I have nitrogen, and I have oxygen. So I'd guess here. What do we think? 200? 200. 200. 300. Okay, so who says lower than 300? Who says higher than 300? Lower. Raise your hand. Okay, who says higher? Okay, Justin, how much higher? 6,000. <laughs> Vibrational modes are difficult to activate. And so in this case here, we certainly cannot assume that these energy levels are really close together. And for most of the calculations that we're going to be performing at room temperature and pressure, we're actually not even getting close to activating the vibrational modes. Right, so that, that energy is relatively high. OK, so in the last few minutes, what we're going to do is we're going to try and put this all together and discuss the consequences of the results. So we're going to, I'll try, I'll skip over the mathematics to, to a large extent, but I wanted to put it in one place. So the partition function for a single particle is going to be the translational times by the rotational times by the vibrational partition functions. Now in this assumption, we're saying that the energy modes are completely uncorrelated to one another meaning that the velocity that it's translating is not correlated to the rotation, which is not correlated to the vibration. So we put it all together, and I'm just going to uh, use our, our shorthand of simplifications here. And there we have it. Uh, yes. I thought you guys said Q. I was like, wait, that is Q. <laughs> and this right here, this is uh, for distinguishability, whether or not it's uh, copper monoxide versus oxygen versus hydrogen. Defined right there. So the partition function for a collection of indistinguishable non-interacting particles also assuming here that there are more energy states than there are particles, which in the case of this type of stuff is going to be okay. The internal energy
Right? We can write it as a function of temperature, or we can write it as a function of this beta parameter. There is a sign difference because there's a reciprocal relationship between temperature and beta, so when you take the derivative of it, you get that negative sign manifesting itself through. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the internal energy normalized by N kBT. So in the case of an ideal monatomic gas particle, we would get three halves. This corresponds to the translation. So in the case of an ideal monatomic particle, that's all we had, plus 2 over 2. And this is for our rotation. And for our vibration, we get a big, messy expression. Here is our information for a ideal diatomic gas. The only thing that changed between the ideal diatomic and the ideal monatomic is that now we have different ways that the particle could store energy. So if we conceptually think about this, I have a diatomic, a monatomic versus a diatomic gas particle. The temperature is just related to the energy stored in the kinetic energy of the system, right? So if I want to accelerate my particle more, let's draw this out here. So if I have a monatomic gas particle versus a diatomic gas particle, and if I have one joule of energy to provide it. In the case of the monatomic gas particle, that one joule of energy will very rapidly increase its temperature because the only thing that I can do is increase its velocity, which in turn proportionally increases its temperature. The Boltzmann constant and the ideal gas constant, all they are is the proportionality relationship between the energy of a particle and its velocity. Now in the case of a diatomic particle, Right? Why we have these, so in this case here, right, these are the vibrational temperatures. We're saying they're uncorrelated with the velocities, and they are uncorrelated, but what ends up happening is if I give my particle sufficient energy, some of that energy is going to go into speeding up the velocities, some of that energy is going to go into speeding up the, and giving it more rotation, and some of that energy may be going to activating the vibrations. Now, according to the equal a priori principle, if it has the same energy level, it has the same probability. So I don't get to choose how the molecule takes the energy. The molecule doesn't even get to choose. All the molecule knows is that if I'm given a certain amount of energy, here are the different ways that I can store it. Now, there are much fewer ways to have vibrations because the energy levels are so far apart. So there's so many fewer <coughs> energy states associated with the vibration corresponding to the translation and rotation. So statistically, this state is not very likely going to be the one that's activated because there's not as many ways to do it. But principally, I can have a particle with 100% translation or 100% vibration or 100% rotation. And if it has the same energy, those are equally probable configurations. But it's not necessarily a fair fight because there's massively more ways to translate the particle than it is to vibrate it. And same thing going forward with the electronic transitions as well. So it makes sense then that that's why more complex molecules obviously have higher heat capacities. Because not all of the energy goes into translation. Some of it goes into translation. But some of it will also go to the different energy modes. And this approach can be expanded for polyatomic particles as well. So if we take a look, let's look at the limits then. And then we can let everyone go and have a relaxing long weekend. 
So the, the vibration and translation are going to be activated for most all of the scenarios that we're going to be carrying about. So the only thing that's going to be significantly changing as a function of temperature is going to be these vibrational modes. So at low temperature, right, as T goes to zero, if we look at the energy associated with the vibration, so we have uh, T This goes to zero as the temperature goes to zero. So in this case here, as, as temperature goes to zero, right, this whole term ends up going to zero. Conversely, as temperature goes very large, in this case would be temperature goes to infinity, or this ratio of the vibrational temperature over the temperature goes to zero, meaning that the temperature is much, much larger. Uh, this same expression here just ends up going to one. So if we were to plot this out, in this case here I have, I believe, if you look at the function of temperature, and this is for chlorine, has a vibrational temperature of 814 Kelvin. Down here at temperature equals zero, and if we plot out the heat capacity, so this is Cv over Nkb, it's going to start off at 5 halves, which is our 3 halves plus our 2 halves. Right, that's going to be the, the uh, heat capacity of chlorine. And then eventually, asymptotically, we're going to add in the effect of all of the activated vibrational modes. So asymptotically, at infinite temperature, let's say over here at 3,000 Kelvin, we're going to have <clears throat> uh, uh, that limit. So the shape of the curve ends up looking something a bit like this. So at the temperature equal to the vibrational temperature, the heat capacity, and this is going to be universal for all diatomic compounds, the heat capacity over NKB is going to be equal to 3.09 or approximately 6 over 2. So you kind of get halfway activation of the vibrational modes as you get to the vibrational temperature. Now, as part of the homework that will be assigned um, over the weekend, what's going to happen is you're going to be doing the same calculation here for a real compound. Now, you know that in the, in the back of the book you have heat capacity correlations, and those are only good for a couple of hundred degrees of Kelvin, usually. In this case, now we have an expression that goes all the way from absolute zero basically a very, very high temperature. So in the homework problem, you'll also be including electronic energy modes to go to even higher temperatures when you start to activate those ones. Now, <clears throat> according to this approach, every compound will behave identically if they have the same vibrational and the same rotational information. Now, these, of course, are just models to approximate how electrons interact. There will be some deviation from these models based on whether or not these energy states are completely independent or based on subtle differences in the properties, the electron clouds, or whatever the case is. But for the most part, they do a pretty good job, and they're not all that complex. Um, executing on these things here and actually evaluating it, you'll find is a, is a, is a unique challenge all on its own, and scaling it up to a mole's worth of particles. 
but hopefully uh, with this additional kind of uh, uh, work, we can see kind of the utility and power of how StatMec can be used to predict the properties of particles by actually treating them like particles and then scaling it up to a large number. Whereas opposed to in classical thermo, we just threw our hands up and said, you know what, let's just measure the heat capacity of this material. Now we can actually predict it from very basic simple models. And so all of the debate that goes on in physical chemistry literature, or what would have gone on, is what is the best way to model this? How do you model different perturbations for different properties, whatever the case is? And that's really where the debate is at on how to accomplish these tasks. And it's mostly for interactions, actually. It's not really for individual particles in a vacuum. Any questions? Have a good weekend, and uh, see you all on Monday.